Some people think superpowers are confined to the superheroes in comic books, cartoons, or the movies. I've certainly never thought of myself as a superhero, yet all my life I've had a superpower. Join me as I explore the incredible science behind the superpower we all have, walking. Greetings everyone, I'm Doug, the principal walker here at Elder Trekker. Before I explain why I believe walking is my superpower, I want to introduce this location. Today I'm at Whitetail Woods Regional Park in Dakota County. The park is named for the whitetail deer that are frequently seen in the area. The trail I'm walking is a paved trail around Empire Lake. This loop trail is about two and a third miles long. Overall, the park has about nine miles of walking trails. There's also a picnic shelter with restrooms, a place to fill up your water bottle, and camper cabins for anyone who wants to spend the night in the park. I think a lot of people are like me and take walking for granted. I know I have never thought about what my body and brain are doing to enable me to walk a trail like this. Then I read, In Praise of Walking, by Shane O'Mara. Shane is a neuroscientist and professor of experimental brain research at Trinity College in Dublin. Unlike other books and articles which focus on the health benefits of walking, Shane focuses on the science of walking. Reading this book made me realize how complex the act of walking is. Shane calls walking an astounding neuromusculoskeletal achievement. When I think of what I learned about the mechanics of walking from Shane O'Mara's book and about the cognitive complexity and the neuromuscular complexity of walking and then add all the physical benefits, the mental benefits, and the social benefits of walking, I could only conclude that walking is my superpower. Walking enhances nearly every aspect of my life and how my body and brain cooperate to keep me walking along a trail like this is an astounding story that scientists are still unraveling. I hope that if you read Shane O'Mara's book, you'll be able to say that walking is your superpower too. So how exactly do we walk? Shane, in his chapter on the mechanics of walking, takes the reader through what happens in our brain and body to enable us to walk a trail like this. In writing about the mechanics of walking, Shane states, the unexpectedly complicated science of how we walk upright is only now being revealed. So what has science revealed about how we walk? The brain, of course, plays a major role in walking. Its first job is balance, keeping us upright and stable. To maintain our balance, our brain uses information from our eyes, from our muscles, tendons, and joints, and from our inner ear. Locked inside our head, in our inner ears, is one of the main components that controls balance. It's called the vestibular system, or the balance organs of the inner ear. You can think of the vestibular system as our internal bubble or spirit level. The vestibular system contains two types of sensors that detect acceleration. The first type, the semicircular canals, detects rotational movement of the head in three directions, up and down, side to side, and tilting. The second type, the otolith organs, detect linear movement, forward and backwards, and the direction of gravity so the brain knows which way is up. Using these sensors in our inner ear, the vestibular system continuously sends signals to the brain. These signals contribute to several different brain functions. 
balance is just one of those. The signals are also used by the brain to maintain our upright posture, help determine which direction we're moving and how fast we're going, and a sense of how our body is moving through space. The vestibular system is a silent sense in that it works without our ever being aware of it. And it's always on, regardless of whether we're walking, sitting, or lying down. I'm not going to explain how the vestibular system works. I will add, though, that Shane O'Mara in In Praise of Walking writes, The mechanism of the vestibular system is a miracle of microengineering. You can read his book for the details. Earlier, I mentioned that to maintain our balance, our brain also needs input from our muscles, tendons, and joints. So how does our brain gather that information? From a network of sensors embedded throughout our entire body. The sensors that are embedded in our muscles are called muscle spindles. A muscle spindle detects changes in the length or stretch of that muscle. Golgi tendon organs are the sensors that are embedded where a muscle and tendon meet. They monitor the tension within that tendon. Joint receptors are the sensors that are embedded at the joint capsules where bones meet. The joint receptors detect the position and movement of joints. These sensors continuously feed information to the brain and certainly contribute to our sense of balance. But they're also responsible for other critical functions. They tell our brain what position our limbs are in so the brain knows how our body is positioned in space. Also, as we move our limbs, the sensors provide the brain with information about the effort we're expending and about the force or heaviness of our actions. This information helps the brain keep our limbs and muscles within a safe range of motion. This awareness of where our limbs are and the stress or strain on them is often called our sixth sense. Its formal name is proprioception. You're probably already familiar with proprioception if you ever closed your eyes and touched your finger to your nose. It's proprioception that enables you to do that. Because my brain is receiving information about where all my limbs are, I can walk along this trail without looking at my feet to see where they are. My brain is constantly determining their location from the proprioception sensors in my legs, ankles, and feet. Also, my brain automatically adjusts the output of my muscles if it detects more strain on them. This smooth asphalt trail is not putting too much strain on my leg muscles. But if I were to head off the trail into the grass or woods alongside this trail, walking would require more effort and my muscles would adjust to the new load. That's proprioception too. Proprioception is closely related to kinesthesia. Proprioception is about the position of the limbs in space. Kinesthesia is our sense of movement the acceleration and velocity of our limbs. It's the awareness of how the body is moving through space. If I take a step forward with my right foot, my brain knows that my body is moving forward and not backward. That's kinesthesia. Proprioception senses the position of my right foot and just tells my brain that it's in front of me now. I hope you're starting to get a sense of the cognitive complexity of walking. As I walk along this trail, my vestibular system is sending information about my head rotation, acceleration, and position to my brain. My brain then combines that information with visual information from my eyes and with information about my limb position and limb movement from the sensors embedded throughout my body. My brain continuously processes all that information to keep me upright and balanced, and I'm completely oblivious to all of it.
So far, we're upright and balanced. Now the question is, how do we actually move our body when we walk? In the movie, An American in Paris, Gene Kelly sang, I got rhythm. Well, we have rhythm too. Maybe not when we're singing and dancing, but definitely when we're walking. The rhythmic motor movements we need to walk are produced by a central pattern generator. The central pattern generator is a group of neurons in the spinal cord. It generates the signals that the muscles use to create the rhythmic pattern we need to walk. The brain can start or stop the central pattern generator, but the brain does not create the rhythmic pattern. That's the job of the neurons in the spinal cord. But both input from the brain and feedback from the peripheral receptors can fine-tune the central pattern generator so our walking remains smooth and stable. The rhythmic pattern our central pattern generator creates for walking is called the gait cycle. The gait cycle begins when the heel on one foot strikes the ground and ends when that same heel strikes the ground again. Each limb completes the gait cycle, but they're at opposite stages at any time in the cycle. Our gait cycle is divided into the stance phase and the swing phase. In the stance phase, the foot is always on the ground. At heel strike, the limb absorbs the shock as the foot contacts the ground. The limb then accepts the full weight of the body and supports it. At mid stance, the limb provides a stable platform for the body to pass over. During the stance phase, the limb transitions from functioning as a shock absorber and stabilizer to functioning as a rigid lever to propel the body forward. In the swing phase, the foot is always off the ground. The opposite limb now supports the weight of the body. The hip, knee, and ankle joints flex to raise the limb so the foot clears the ground, usually by about a half inch or one centimeter. The limb advances forward so it's in front of the body. The swing phase ends as the limb fully extends forward to prepare for the weight transfer at the next heel strike. The average person at a normal walking speed completes one gait cycle in about one second. Of course, we repeat this rhythmic pattern over and over and over. Shane O'Mara writes that walking requires the rapid coordination of the activity in your brain and nerves to successive sequences of contracting and relaxing muscles and muscle groups. During the gait cycle, the central pattern generator sends the rhythmic signals that contract and relax the muscles in our legs. This video was created to show the complex interaction of the six primary muscles in our legs when we walk. It helps visualize the rhythmic walking pattern created by the central pattern generator. The rhythmic pattern alternates between our left and right legs as the different muscles contract and relax. While this video focuses on just the six primary muscles in our legs, we probably use closer to 200 muscles to walk. Besides the leg muscles, we use the core muscles and, to a lesser extent, our arm and shoulder muscles. Some people describe walking as just putting one foot in front of the other. With our central pattern generator and the rhythm it supplies, walking is much more complex than it seems. I hope you're beginning to see what an astounding act walking is and why I call it my superpower. Our brain keeps us upright and balanced and a central pattern generator keeps our legs moving. Now it's just navigating to where we want to go. The story of how we navigate begins with the work of Edward Chase Tolman, a psychologist at the University of California, Berkeley, and the classic experiments he conducted with rats in mazes. He placed a bit of food at the end of one of the legs of a complex maze. 
He then watched the rat as it explored the maze and discovered a path to the food. Once the rat learned a path to the food, he blocked that path. But to get to the food, the rat quickly switched to a new path. Tolman suggested that to switch so easily to a new path when the old path was blocked, the rat must have some spatial knowledge of its environment, like the spatial knowledge we get when we study a map. Tolman concluded that rats, as well as humans, build an internal map of their environment that enables them to navigate through that environment. He coined the term cognitive map to describe this mental picture we have of our external environment. Shane O'Mara writes that this outwardly simple experiment was a landmark in our understanding of how we navigate the world. It told us that animals, and presumably humans, quickly develop internal maps of the world that flexibly guide goal-oriented behavior. Tolman proposed that by exploring our environment, like I'm doing today by walking this trail, we create a cognitive map that enables us to navigate and find the optimal path through our environment. What he didn't address is where in the brain our cognitive map resides. Edward Tolman proposed the idea of a cognitive map in the 1940s. It wasn't until three decades later, in the 1970s, that researchers were finally able to identify where in the brain this map resides and some of its key components. John O'Keefe, inspired by the experiments of Edward Tolman, was the first to expand our knowledge of the cognitive map and spatial navigation. He was a neuroscientist at the University College London and was studying the hippocampus in the brain of a rat. In his experiments, he connected an electrode to one specific neuron in the hippocampus. He then placed the rat in an enclosure and let it freely walk around the enclosure, like the rat shown in this video. He discovered that when the rat was in one specific area of the enclosure, the neuron was active, that is, it fired. When the rat moved to a new area of the enclosure, the neuron was silent. John O'Keefe called these neurons place cells. The place field is the area in the environment where that place cell is active. Place cells indicate to our brain our location in our environment. They are like the you are here indicators on a map. Of course, we don't have just one place field and place cell. Experiments with rats show that different place cells fired in different locations. In this experiment, a rat was placed on a track with food at each end. As it ran along the track, eight different place cells fire. The different colors show the different place fields of the eight place cells. This sequence of how many different place cells fire uniquely represents this environment. They help the brain create an internal representation of its external environment. Shane O'Mara states that they, meaning place cells, have come to be recognized as core elements of the cognitive map. They tell you where you are in the world and they work best and acquire the most information when we are walking. Thanks to the work of John O'Keefe and his discovery of place cells, researchers believe that cognitive mapping is one of the functions of the hippocampus region of the brain. But there was still more to be discovered. In 2005, my Britt Moser and Edvard Moser, two neuroscientists at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, discovered another component of our cognitive map. The Mosers attached electrodes to a neuron in the region of a rat's brain called the entorhinal cortex, a region of the brain connected to the hippocampus. There they discovered a new cell type, the grid cell, that had very unusual geometric properties. 
A place cell fires when the rat occupies one specific location. But a grid cell fires when the rat occupies one of many different but regularly spaced locations. Those locations form the nodes of a grid, and that grid is in the pattern of hexagons, or you can think of the pattern as equilateral triangles. This grid of triangles covers the entire local environment. If we could see the grid that one of my grid cells creates as I walk this trail, it might look something like this picture. The place field indicates my current location along the trail. The pattern of equilateral triangles created by a grid cell covers my local environment, as if the ground is tiled with these triangles. That was an overly simple example because, like place cells, we don't have just one grid cell. We have many. Multiple grid cells are organized in modules. Here's an example of a grid cell module that's composed of 16 different grid cells that are packed in a 4x4 four four square. Each color represents a different grid cell that fires at a different location. The grid cell modules are like tiles. They repeat over and over to cover our entire local environment. Each grid cell still fires in the pattern of hexagons or equilateral triangles. Here I highlighted the hexagonal firing pattern for one grid cell so you could more easily see the pattern. All the other grid cells in the module have the same firing pattern except it's offset by its position in the grid cell module. What does our brain do with all these grids? Grid cells are a way for the brain to encode the direction we're walking and how far we've walked. By keeping track of the firing sequence of the grid cells, our brain determines the direction and distance that we've moved. Here, the grid cells corresponding to the black, red, and orange circles fire to indicate that we've moved a certain distance towards the southwest. The discovery of both the place cell and the grid cell was a significant advancement in our understanding of how the brain functions. For their work, the Nobel Committee awarded in 2014 John O'Keefe, My Britt Moser, and Edvard Moser the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for their discoveries of nerve cells in the brain that enable a sense of place and navigation. The Nobel Committee wrote, an internal map of the environment and a sense of place are needed for recognizing and remembering our environment and for navigation. This navigation ability is one of the most complex of brain functions. The story of our cognitive map does not end with play cells and grid cells. Researchers have identified other specialized cell types that contribute to our cognitive map and to our spatial navigation ability. For example, there are head direction cells which fire only when we face a specific direction. You can think of our head direction cells as an internal compass. Border cells which respond only to boundaries or borders in our environment like a wall or a building. And speed cells, whose rate of firing encodes how fast we're moving. Speed cells are an internal speedometer. I would need another video to describe these and all the other specialized cell types that exist in our brain for spatial navigation. I think it's safe to say that our brain encodes a lot of information about our environment in our cognitive map. Not only does our cognitive map help us navigate our environment, whether it's our home, neighborhood, or a park like this, but it also helps us organize, store, and retrieve memories of all the places and events in our life. So how am I using my cognitive map as I walk this trail? Because I've already developed a cognitive map of this park from previous visits, I can now navigate to any location in the park from any other location. I could, for example, 
walk to the location where I remember being startled by a flock of wild turkeys. Or I could easily walk to the camper cabins on the other side of the park. My cognitive map gives me complete flexibility in how I choose to navigate this environment. If someone were to ask me what enables us to walk, I'd say that we need balance, the ability to keep ourselves upright and stable on two legs, rhythm, the ability to repetitively contract and relax the different muscle groups that propel us forward, and navigation, the ability to know where we are and how to get to where we want to be. Walking seems easy because we're completely unaware of what our brain and body are doing to enable us to walk. But there's a cognitive and a neuromuscular complexity to walking that is truly astounding. I'm not a neuroscientist, so my discussion here has been quite simplistic. But even as simple as this has been, I think you can still get a sense of what an amazing ability walking really is. There's a lot more information about the science of walking and the health benefits of walking in In Praise of Walking by Shane O'Mara. Reading this book made me think about walking in an entirely different way. In fact, I now think of walking as my superpower. As I finish this walk, I'll leave you with one final thought from Shane. The core lesson of this book is this. Walking enhances every aspect of our social, psychological, and neural functioning. It is the simple, life-enhancing, health-building prescription we all need. If you haven't already and are in the area, please check out the trails here at Whitetail Woods. They're a great opportunity to use your superpower. I hope this video inspires you to remain both physically and mentally active. If you like this type of content and want to see more from Elder Trekker, click the subscribe button. If you want to be notified when I upload a new video, click the bell icon. And if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.